Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is Asset Management in Dynamics 365 Supply Chain Management, Asset Management Overview. My name is David, and I'll be your moderator today. We're broadcasting this session through Teams Live events, and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. When you join this event, your name, email address, and phone number may be viewable by other session participants in the attendee list. By joining, you're agreeing to this experience. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within the coming weeks. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions during the session in the Q&A panel and after the presentation in a live Q&A segment. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Ann Krupke, Senior Fast Track Solution Architect, and Johan Hoffman, Senior Product Manager. Ann, over to you. Thanks, David. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Thanks for joining us today to talk about asset management. I am Ann Krupke. I'll be your main presenter today. I'm joined by Johan Hoffman from the pro product team who will help us answer questions throughout. You can see um, I am a senior fast track solution architect here at Microsoft and I specialize in supply chain and manufacturing topics. That's my email there. If you have any questions you want to send after the fact and feel free to connect and give me a shout on LinkedIn. This tech talk is kicking off a new series on asset management that we're producing. This first session is the overview of the asset management module. Next month, we will be back with a deep dive on the sensor data intelligence add-in that was just released in public preview. Then we'll dig in a little bit more into how to configure the asset management module to support the acquire to dispose lifecycle. We'll do that in the acquire and install assets deep dive and maintain assets deep dive. We will wrap up the series with an installment that talks about the integration between the asset management module in Dynamics 365 supply chain management and the field service module in the Dynamics 365 CE application suite. We are going to keep it interesting and we've got a riddle of the day today, which is why are bank offices so cold? So put your answers in the chat and we'll reveal the answer at the end of the session. So you've got to stick around to see. So let's talk about what we're going to cover in this session. We'll start by talking about what asset management is, why we use it and how we use it. Then we're going to cover the key concepts and terminology in the asset management area, which we'll build upon in further sessions. We'll have a brief demo of the module in Dynamics and the workspaces that come with it. And then we will wrap up by talking about licensing and relevant resources with some time for Q&A at the end. This overview presentation is going to be a bit more slide heavy, but the deep dive sessions we're doing uh, as follow ups will be a bit more detailed on how we take these concepts and implement them in Dynamics. So it will be a little bit more system heavy in future sessions. So let's get into the background of asset management. Starting with what is asset management? Asset management is a tool that's used to plan, optimize, execute, and track an organization's needed maintenance activities and all that entails with priorities, skills, materials, tools, and information to make sure assets are operational. In short, asset management supports companies' maintenance activities. It's also often referred to as enterprise asset management or maintenance management. While maintenance is often an area that's looked at as very separate from other processes in a business, the benefits of using asset management are felt by users all throughout the business. Let's walk through how asset management, or actually the lack of asset management, can make a difference for different personas in your business. 
for a production manager, unexpected downtime on machines can cause delivery delays and lacking visibility into plan maintenance makes it hard to coordinate the production schedule around the maintenance schedule so that we're fulfilling orders on time. Purchasing agents need to know about upcoming maintenance so they can order spare parts to be available on time or else maintenance might be delayed. For cost controllers, time and materials spent on maintaining assets is a significant portion of the total cost of ownership, and so it's vital to have clarity on what our maintenance costs are. Sales managers have to manage customer relationships that could end up suffering if we have late deliveries due to machine downtime, especially unexpected machine downtime. And quality managers need to deal with product quality issues, which may arise from improper maintenance of equipment. So we can see through these examples that maintenance issues have an impact throughout the entire business and having a good asset management system will help improve multiple areas of the business. So what are the benefits of implementing asset management? Implementing an asset management system first and foremost helps you reduce your asset maintenance cost by streamlining your spare parts inventory, reducing overtime spent to balance unexpected outages, and it helps you improve your maintenance planning efficiency. One study that was done indicated that 30% of all asset maintenance costs were unnecessary and could be prevented with proper asset management. Asset management also allows us to reduce equipment downtime by implementing preventative and predictive maintenance rules, which results in increased production throughput, as well as improving our asset lifespans so we don't have to spend money on replacing assets as often. Additionally, we can increase our operational efficiency by using the asset management module in Dynamics since it's heavily integrated with the rest of our system. Instead of asset maintenance activities operating in a silo in a separate system, we can coordinate work order scheduling, maintenance worker allocation, and spare parts inventory along with the rest of our business operational activities. Let's walk through some of the common scenarios that companies use asset management for in Dynamics. Three of the most common scenarios we see are using asset management to maintain equipment used in production, warehouse equipment such as forklifts, or even tracking the maintenance of a shipping fleet if a company runs their own shipping fleet. So these are the three scenarios we're gonna focus most heavily on in this Tech Talk series because they're the most commonly used scenarios with Dynamics, but other scenarios may include facility maintenance such as your HVAC systems or smoke detectors, customer asset maintenance. So this would be where you provide maintenance for assets owned by your customers, which could be assets you produced or just assets that you have a contract to maintain for your customers. Or you could be using asset management to track the maintenance of leased assets. So assets owned by your company, but installed on a customer location. Some industries have really specialized maintenance requirements, and in those cases, customers often look for a maintenance solution that's specifically designed for their industry to support their specific requirements. Asset management works together with the fixed assets module in Dynamics to support the full asset life cycle, which we call the acquire to dispose process. So let's go through the high level steps of the acquire to dispose process and then the support that the fixed asset and asset management modules provide. The first step in acquire to dispose is acquire. In this step, we record the asset as a fixed asset so we can track the value, capitalize the asset, depreciate it, or otherwise manage the financials on our assets. Next, we have the installation step. This is where we get more into the asset management side of things. We install the asset in a location in our facility and set up all the information that we're going to use to create and execute maintenance for that asset, such as the applicable spare parts for the asset and any recurring maintenance that we'll need to do. 
We can also track warranty information and link the asset to a production resource. Next, we have the maintain step. This step obviously is the longest in duration because we are going to be maintaining assets from the time we get the asset installed until we're ready to retire the asset. In the asset management module, we track and execute different kinds of maintenance, such as breakdown maintenance and preventative maintenance. We capture the asset history and costs associated with the maintenance, and we have tools such as the schedule board and the mobile workspace, which support the recording of the maintenance that's done. All of the information that we track on our assets is then used in our analytics and KPIs, which we're going to talk about briefly in our demo later and then more in our deep dive sessions. And finally, once the asset is no longer able to be used, we dispose of the asset. In asset management, this entails updating the lifecycle state to retire it, and then we use the fixed asset module to track the financial disposal and reporting on that asset. The asset management module in Dynamics is heavily integrated with other areas of the system as well. So let's walk through how it relates to modules in addition to fixed assets, which we just mentioned. Firstly, we have a relationship to the production control module. Through the production floor execution interface, we can request maintenance, report downtime on assets, and view and update asset counter values. As I mentioned before, we can also link assets to production resources so we can track production quality, quantity and production hours for that asset. We use the procurement and sourcing module first to buy assets and track, track the acquisition process. And then we also can use the procurement and sourcing module to buy spare parts that will be used in maintenance of assets. We have the inventory management module, which is used to track spare parts inventory and their consumption into work orders. If we want, we can enable spare parts inventory for the advanced warehouse management side of things as well for using the mobile device to track the movement of the materials around the warehouse and to do picking for replenishments and things like that. We also use the master planning module to forecast spare parts usage and drive planned uh, procurement orders, as well as incorporating planned maintenance orders into our production schedule. We use the workers and capabilities in the human resources module to help us assign work orders to the right maintenance worker to get the job done. And finally, we have the project management and accounting module, which is the financial backbone of asset management. When we record work order time and materials, we post them against a project that's related to the asset for tracking all of the costs associated with asset management. So now that we understand a little bit about what asset management is and the related benefits, let's dig into the key concepts around assets that we're gonna build on in the next deep dive sessions. starting with assets. Assets are anything that we need to perform maintenance on, although typically when we talk about assets, we think of machines or machine parts. So for each of the concepts that we talk through in this section, we're going to give an example of that concept for three of our common asset management use cases, production equipment, warehouse equipment, and a shipping fleet. So for production equipment, an example of an asset might be a bottling line in our bottling plant. For warehouse equipment, an asset might be a forklift. And in a shipping fleet scenario, we could model our truck as an asset. Again, the key defining feature of an asset in this context is it's something that we need to service or maintain. When we are setting up assets in the system, there's several kinds of information that we can track against the asset. We have the life cycle state, which is what the current status of the asset is. We can track user defined attributes such as color or model or make. We track the vendor that we bought the asset from. 
And related to that, we can track warranty information on our assets. We can assign assets a criticality, which essentially tells us how important the asset is to being able to produce. And we use that to assign criticality on work orders. Assets can also be assigned service levels, which helps us drive work order priorities to determine which work order should be done first as a combination of the service level and the criticality. Assets can be configured in a hierarchy with parent and child assets as needed by your business. We might do this if we have a machine asset that has components that need to be maintained on a different schedule or following different rules than the overall machine maintenance. For example, if our bottling line is modeled as a parent asset, we might have child assets for our liquid dispenser system, the cap installer, and the shrink wrapper if we'll sometimes individually service those three child assets individually and other times we'll service the bottling line all at once. In our warehousing environment, we may have a parent asset for the forklift, which drives our overall annual inspection, but have children assets for the braking system, the forks and the horn. Again, if we need to execute or track maintenance on parts of a machine specifically. And in a shipping fleet, we may have our truck as the parent asset where we have the engine, the ABS, and the trailer connector as child assets. It's also possible to have more than just two levels of parent and child assets. What you end up with will be based on your business needs and how you need to drive your maintenance activities. The asset structure is flexible and can be maintained as you install new assets or replace assets over time. Assets get installed in functional locations. Functional locations are linked to a site in a warehouse in Dynamics for spare parts inventory tracking, but they don't typically have a one-to-one -one relationship with your actual warehouse locations. We use functional locations to track where our assets are, track our costs of the assets, and group maintenance on our assets based on assets in the same functional location. In our production plant, we may, for example, have a functional location that represents the entire bottling area, and that would be where our two bottling line assets are installed. In a warehousing scenario, we may have a functional location that just represents the entire warehouse, and that's what we'll install our forklift and pallet jack assets against. We don't necessarily need to track the forklift moving to all the different locations within the warehouse. We just wanna know what warehouse it's in first so we can make sure we have the right maintenance workers assigned to it and two, so that we can procure spare parts inventory to the appropriate warehouse to perform maintenance activities on our forklift and pallet jack. In our shipping fleet, again, we wouldn't necessarily want to be tracking the truck as it moves all over if we're going to be performing all of our maintenance at our home location. So we could create a virtual location for the entire fleet of trucks and just call it shipping fleet. We could also create locations that relate to each of our main facility locations and then assign or install our assets of our trucks at the home facility so we know um, when it's at that facility, that's where we'll do maintenance and procure materials to and assign workers from. Functional locations, just like assets, can also have a hierarchy with multiple levels. We can see in this picture where I've got the blue boxes, which are our functional locations. We have a functional location for site one, and under that, two children locations for the production warehouse and the distribution warehouse. And then the production warehouse is split further into the bottling area and the packaging area. And then we just have one flat functional location for the shipping fleet. The red boxes are the assets. So under the bottling area, we've installed the bottling lines. In the distribution warehouse, we've installed the forklifts. And in the shipping fleet, we've installed the trucks. So this is just to illustrate the example that functional locations can be in a hierarchy and we can install assets at every level of the functional location hierarchy. 
It is possible to move assets from one functional location to another, but you can't change the functional hier functional location hierarchy itself after you set it up. So we can add locations to the hierarchy, but we couldn't move existing locations around within the existing hierarchy. When you move an asset from one functional location to another, the cost of maintenance before the move stays attached to the original functional location. So what that means is asset costs are always related to the functional location that it was installed in at the time the cost was incurred. Asset bombs are a list of all the items that are used on an asset in its lifetime, including the parts it came with, as well as any spare parts installed through maintenance activities. In our production example, on our shrink wrapper asset, we have a heating element, we have the original cutting blade that came with the shrink wrapper, and we've recorded that we have a new cutting blade that we replaced through maintenance activities. In the same way for our forklift in the braking system, we have the original brake pads as well as replacement brake pads, and we could even have multiple replacement brake pads over the years. And then again, some brake fluid on the asset bomb. And then on the truck engine for our shipping fleet scenario, we may have spark plugs, the original fuel injector, and the replacement fuel injector that we installed through maintenance activities. So the difference between an asset bomb and having parent and child assets is that the asset bomb tells us the history of the parts used in an asset, but it's not driving maintenance on those specific parts. We would use a parent and child relationship again if we want to have multiple assets that have different rules for how we maintain them. But having an asset bomb is just a history of all of the different parts that we've used on an asset. On the asset bomb, we can set expiration dates for when that part is no longer used, and we can say whether or not a particular asset bomb line is active. The last key concepts that we're gonna talk about for assets is asset counters. Asset counters are used to track certain data about an asset and see a value for that counter, which we can use to trigger maintenance activities. For example, on our bottling line, we might have counters that are set up to track the number of active production hours on that bottling line or the quantity produced on the bottling line. For our forklift, we might have counters which track our engine temperature or the mileage on our forklift. For trucks on our shipping fleet, we might again track mileage or we might track internal temperature in our trailer. Counter values can be registered manually by users in the system. If, it, if the value is production hours or production quantity and the assets linked to a production resource, then we can have the system automatically update those values. And with the new IoT, uh, sensor data intelligence add-in, we can use IoT devices to update the value of our counters as well if we have an IoT sensor that's tracking that value. The counter values can be viewed as an average value over time or as a total value on the counter. So that's the high level concepts that we track on assets in the asset management module. And now let's talk about our maintenance concepts. First, our first maintenance concept is maintenance requests. So these are requests that are going to be made to a manager or a planner, which indicate that an asset needs maintenance or repair. This could be raised by anyone on the shop floor who notices that a machine needs maintenance, either because it is broken down or it's going to break down. Then we have maintenance rounds. So maintenance rounds are maintenance tasks that you need to carry out at repeating intervals. And the third main kind of maintenance is via maintenance plans. And maintenance plans define the rules for pre-planned maintenance jobs, which can be based either on time passing or based on counter values. 
When we're classifying these different kinds of maintenance, maintenance requests are used for corrective maintenance, and maintenance rounds and plans are for preventative, predictive, and reactive maintenance. We'll talk in more detail about what these different kinds of maintenance are and how to set them up in dynamics in the Maintain Assets Tech Talk. These three maintenance components together end up making our maintenance schedule. So we take all of our maintenance requests, our maintenance rounds and maintenance plans for a certain time frame, and then you use that to create our maintenance schedule, which is the list of all the maintenance activities we need to do at a certain time. Once we've created our maintenance schedule, we convert it into work orders, which are then assigned to maintenance workers and used to record the execution of maintenance activities, which includes the materials, spare parts that we consumed, and the time of the maintenance workers. You can also manually create work orders as needed instead of doing it through the maintenance schedule process. So let's talk about some examples of the three components of the maintenance schedule. One example for a maintenance request would be if a shrink wrapper was jammed and it needs to be fixed, then a production employee may submit a maintenance request so a maintenance supervisor can create a work order to go fix it. An example of a maintenance round would be if we need to periodically check that all the fire extinguishers are all properly functioning in the plant. So again, maintenance rounds are activities that are repeated on a regular basis for the same kind of asset. And we may have a maintenance plan would be used in the case where we have a forklift which needs to have an inspection driven on an annual basis um, to have its servicing and tune-up executed. We do have an integration between the asset management module and the project management and accounting module, which I mentioned earlier. And what that allows us to do is several things related to maintenance. First, we can use the integration with projects to create a forecast for the time and materials against um, our, our expected maintenance. So that's important because it helps us drive planned spare parts procurement instead of waiting until we're about to do maintenance to create a purchase order for spare parts. We can actually use projects functionality to forecast consumption of spare parts materials and drive procurement of those materials so they're not delaying maintenance activities. We can also, once we actually execute the procurement of the spare parts, we can track those against the project, just like you normally track a purchase order against a project in the project management and accounting module. When we create actual work orders, we record the time spent by the worker and the cost of that time against a project. We can also use projects to bill for maintenance on customer owned assets. So it doesn't just have to be us recording the cost so that we know how much money we've spent on our assets, but we can also take the time and materials and use that to drive billing for our customers if we're maintaining their assets. When it comes to creating projects or tracking projects, it's not one project for the entire asset management module. We can create different projects as needed for specific assets for certain asset types or based on the work order type that's executed. We also have the ability with maintenance to break down the types of costs and then create budgets for them. Our maintenance cost types in the system are preventative, corrective, and investment. So those are the three ways we can categorize our maintenance costs. And then for each cost type that I just defined, we can create a budget for that cost in the period to set a benchmark for our expected maintenance costs. We have the ability to track the approval of the budget that we specified 
and also a function that allows us to copy the existing budget to a new period so that we can do some basic budget management for maintenance activities. So now we're going to take a quick step over to the system and just review the asset management module and the workspaces in Dynamics 365 Supply Chain Management. So in Dynamics, it is an entire module that's called Asset Management, which we use for the activities we've talked about in this tech talk so far. We have two workspaces associated with the asset management module, which are maintenance request management and work order management. We have our asset information, functional locations, maintenance request, work orders, work order pools, maintenance downtime activities, our related procurement activities to work orders, our maintenance schedules, like I mentioned, asset loading functionality, and of course, inquiries and reports related to the module. We have some periodic functions that help us update data as well as creating work orders and then all of the setup that's involved in the asset management module. Again, we'll spend a lot more time talking about the specific configurations and menu items available in the asset management module in future sessions. Now let's go take a quick look at the maintenance request workspace. So this workspace is meant for a maintenance supervisor to review requests from um, any users on the shop floor for maintenance. This is um, in this workspace, we have four summary tiles at the top, and these are active links that'll take you to the detailed form. So we can create a maintenance request from here, view active requests, and view some time-based queries that show us recent maintenance requests. In the middle here, we have four different views, so we can look at maintenance requests without work orders, active maintenance requests, and again, that's time-based queries. And at the bottom, we have links to relevant uh, additional data. On the analytics tab, we have, we're using the inbuilt embedded Power BI integration for Dynamics to have some out-of-the-box dashboards to help you look at your maintenance request data. So we have information about a request breakdown by trade, request type, the life cycle state of the request, um, and maintenance job types. We can also see how long it takes us to close maintenance requests and on average as well as the minimum and maximum. And this report has some of the, the information about the most requested skills and most created types. We can also just see the, the details on the maintenance request details tab. So that's the high level on the maintenance request management workspace. We also have the work order management workspace, which is meant for the actual execution of your maintenance activities. We have another row of our summary tiles, which show us the number of work orders by status, as well as work orders with faults or work orders with related maintenance downtime. So these links would take us into the form that shows the results of the query for that tile. We see our active work orders in the screen and we can create a new work order or update work orders from here. Again, we have links to relevant data sets. And then again, we have an analytics tab which uses the embedded Power BI integration uh, with Dynamics to show us information about our work orders. So a breakdown of work orders by type, by functional location type, by asset type, we also have that kind of insight information on the right, which talks about most repaired asset type, where the functional location with the most work orders and information like that. On the work order details tab, we have even further breakdown that shows us information about our work orders, both planned and unplanned. And then on asset repair insights, we collect the data about mean time between failures and mean time to repair, which are two key asset KPIs. There isn't a ton of data here because it's just demo data, but as we maintain more assets, we can calculate those values for each asset and review them in that workspace. So that is the high level what you get in the asset management module in Dynamics, along with the two workspaces that you can use to execute your day-to-day -day activities in the asset management module.
with that, let's talk about licensing and resources. So I want to review licensing since sometimes under certain conditions you will need additional licenses to use asset management in Dynamics. The licensing is determined based on the number of assets that you have in your tenant in a given month. If you have fewer than 100 assets in your tenant, you don't need any additional licensing. Your regular supply chain management licenses are sufficient um, if you have up to 100 assets. If you're over 100 assets, for each 100 assets, you need to get an add-on license, so it's not the same cost as a full SCM license. I think it's uh, $50 per month, and you'll need to buy one license for each additional 100 assets in your tenant. The number of add-on licenses that you have to buy is capped at 50. So what that means is if you have 5,000 assets, you can keep having more assets. You just don't have to keep buying licenses after you hit 50. So 50 is the max number of licenses, but it's not the max number of assets. You can still have over 5,000 assets. And then I wanted to take a minute to highlight some additional resources if you want to do research on your own before we come back and do our deep dive sessions. We have quite a lot of Microsoft documentation articles around the fixed or sorry, around the asset management module. So if you haven't checked that out in a while, I definitely recommend you do so. For anybody who doesn't know, we acquired Microsoft acquired the asset management module from the Dynaway product for asset management back in 2018. So since we've acquired it um, about four years ago, we've added a lot of our documentation and um, so definitely if you haven't checked it out in a year or so, go look at it. We have a ton of documentation. I specifically wanted to call out the integration with fixed assets so you can see how information is shared between the asset management module and the fixed assets module so that we can track the cost of maintenance as part of the total cost of our fixed assets. I also wanted to make sure people know that we have an integration with Dynamics 365 guides and asset management. So um, Dynamics 365 guides is what we use the HoloLens, uh, the mixed reality tool for, and you can integrate that with asset management so that you can use it to train people on how to do maintenance on machines. We've also added documentation around the new sensor data intelligence add-in, which is an update to the IoT intelligence add-in that was previously released by Microsoft. So um, like I mentioned at the very beginning, we will do a deep dive session on sensor data intelligence next month, but if you're curious in the meantime, you can check out the documentation that we've already posted. And one thing I wanted to make sure we mention is there is a mobile component to asset management. And if you want information about how to set up the asset management mobile workspace, there's a link here. It's a workspace in the regular Dynamics 365 application, mobile application that you can download from the App Store. As far as learning paths go, when we're talking about uh, the Microsoft Learn site, we have two learn paths. We have the configure asset management, and the work with asset management learn path. So these are more self-guided training that helps you learn how to work with the asset management module and it includes labs uh, for you to execute in a sandbox environment as well as check your knowledge points throughout the learning. We also have community resources that are available if you are a partner or a customer who is implementing asset management and you have questions. We have in the Yammer Insider Program group, we have a specific group devoted to asset management, which Johan and team are really good about um, staying involved in as well as other uh, community users to help answer questions and talk about roadmaps or gaps uh, in the asset management module. On the Dynamics 365 community site, which is the same site that you watch Tech Talk recordings on, 
We have the supply chain management forum, which also has a group for asset management. So you can also ask the community and the product team questions about the asset management module and get answers that way. And then, of course, we always welcome your feedback on the functionality that we have in the system. So if you have any feedback on the asset management module, we would uh, love it if you submit an idea on the ideas site and make sure that you vote for other people's ideas because we use that to drive development in our roadmap. With that, I'll take it back to our riddle of the day, which is why are bank offices so cold? And the answer is they're trying to freeze their assets. So shout out to the person in the chat who got that right. Good job. That brings us to the end of our content. So um, I'll ask Johan if you want to come off mute and if you want to bring up any good questions that were asked or if there's any open questions we still need to answer. Yeah, so uh, there were a couple of questions uh, around the leasing part you mentioned, Anne. Um, is okay. there any kind of dedicated way to configure uh, the lease scenario? Or is it more that you just install the assets? So there's a couple of components with asset leasing um, and we can, um, I can pull up some documentation, but there is in the, in it's actually technically part of Dynamics 365 Finance, but we have a whole set of asset leasing financial tracking capabilities and I can post a link in the chat to the, um, the asset leasing documentation. When it comes to asset management, the asset leasing portion or how we maintain leased assets is going to be a, a lot more just about how we set up asset management, but we do have functionality on the finance side for tracking asset leases as well. Does that answer the question? Johan? Uh, yes, please. Yes, thanks. Okay. Um, there was also a couple of questions around uh, creating a work order for a functional location instead of for an asset. Um, uh, in the current implementation, you create a work order for an asset. You cannot create it for a functional location. It is some feedback uh, we are tracking. Um, so, so it is something we, we have in. The yeah. There is also um, a function that allows you to create an asset that is linked to specifically just a copy of the functional location, right? Where um, basically it, the asset name is the same as the functional location name if you did need to run maintenance, for example, on like an entire building. I can link to um, the document, the Microsoft doc that talks about that as well and publish it. But it's it's not the same thing as being able to just run maintenance on a functional location, but we do have the ability to create an asset that has a one to one relationship with the functional location. Uh, there's a more practical question. Uh, when will links to subsequent asset maintenance TikToks be published? You should be able to register for the future sessions now. Um, so the dates are put put in the chat. The only one that we haven't scheduled, sorry, the dates were in the presentation at the beginning. Um, the only the only one we haven't scheduled is the integration between asset management and field service. We still need to get that one scheduled. But if you go to the the Tech Talk site where you can see upcoming Tech Talks, you should be already able to register for the sensor data intelligence add-in session, acquire and install assets and maintain assets. Does that answer the question? Yes. Then there's uh, one question from Ham uh, Hamid. Uh, we can create a purchase order or purchase requisition from the work order. May I know that any reason why the functionality only creates the header of the PO 
or PR, why it can't be detailed up until lines. Maybe the lines can be based on the maintenance job forecast. I don't have any straight answer to that. I, th I think it, it sounds like a good idea. Um, but that is something we'll take in. Uh, also here you can use uh, or, or post an idea so we can track it. But um, I'll definitely take that in. OK. Then there are a couple of questions around the mobile workspaces, the, the native mobile solution built on the mobile workspaces in Dynamics. Um, the mobile workspaces has now been deprecated and we are planning to replace this app uh, with a new one um, that we are going to build on, on the Power Platform. Awesome. I'm excited to see what the new application looks like. If some of you have um, experiences with uh, using the, the native mobile uh, solution, you are more than welcome to contact me. Um, I'll be interested in your feedback uh, using the mobile solution. What are the scenarios you are looking for? Yeah, and we do. I did put Johan's email here, so let me go back to that original screen so you can um, email Johan if you have any comments around your requirements for the mobile app. There were also a couple of questions around um, using IoT data to drive uh, scenarios in the asset management, for example, tracking the usage of of the assets with the use of the counters. Uh, as you can see, there's a separate slot for that where Anne will go into to details in um, for the new IoT intelligence uh, feature. And also in the resources, you can see a link to a documentation uh, where we have a very detailed um, description on how you onboard this feature, but also how you um, figure the scenarios and how you set up uh, a demo. Uh, you can emulate a sensor signal uh, with a with an, a service. So that is all very well uh, documented. But more. On oh, that, we've got some new videos coming, and you might recognize the voice on them. <laughs> yeah. I just posted a link in the chat to the sensor data intelligence homepage. So if you wanted to to check out that link before we post the the presentation. Um, and I'm also posting a link to the asset management overview documentation. OK, uh, any other questions, Johan? So there were a couple of questions around um, um, Planning maintenance uh, based on machine capacity. Uh, so, so how it works right now when you schedule a work order. If you have linked your asset to a resource, then you can create a capacity reservation on that resource. And when you do scheduling of the work order, it will respect any uh, capacity reserved by a production order. Uh, Unfortunately, it's not the other way around as of now. So when you schedule with limited or finite capacity on the production orders, it will not recognize the um, reservation done by the um, work order, scheduled work order. This is also something that is on our uh, roadmap. Which, and we're also um, talking about including the planned maintenance activities in the Gantt chart view for production schedules, right? We can see it today. We can see the the planned uh, maintenance activity. It's we cannot um, drag and drop it and and schedule around, so we cannot really use it for visual scheduling. Okay. Like you can do for production jobs. Gotcha.
OK, it looks like we also have a question about um, field service versus asset management and service management. And um, we can talk about that on a high level. We'll definitely talk about it in more detail in our session that talks about the integration between asset management and field service using dual right. Um, but typically when you look at what we have in field service versus asset management, asset management has always traditionally been used for maintaining in-house assets. That's not to say you can't use it to maintain customer assets, but typically it, it has been used for maintaining your own production equipment or warehousing equipment where the field service module has a lot more functionality around dispatching technicians um, to go get to a customer and do maintenance. So thinking about things like driving time and inventory that's in their their truck or their van. Um, so there's there are things that field service does really well for specific requirements and there's things that asset management does really well uh, for asset management, creating the, the planned preventative maintenance, the using the maintenance plans um, and the maintenance schedules is a really strong functionality there. So um, there are different reasons why you might use one or the other or both depending on what your requirements are. And again, we will talk about each of the each of the capabilities and how we can use dual right to link between the two of them in more detail in our deep dive session. Um, we have another question. Co company assets installed at customer sites with the contract in place uh, with the customer which involves maintenance of assets at a customer location. So that that's a scenario that we do see people use asset management and field service together for because um, again, you have the people using asset management to drive the planned maintenance activities according to contracts, um, but you use the field service side of things for um, keeping track of the service contract, dispatching workers, um, things like that. So that's definitely a scenario that I've seen people use Dynamics for. And normally what we would see there is they're using a mix of asset management and field service. Anything that you want to add to that, Johan? Uh, no. OK. Um. So if we have a limitation on workers and our assets are a really large amount, so we don't have enough workers to maintain all our assets, how can we make a maintenance plan where they can reach all of them? I believe we have functional or sorry, we have functionality that allows you to do capacity loading, capacity planning for maintenance activities based on a worker schedule. Can you that, that, can you that confirm your when we, when we schedule the the work orders, then we do the capacity reservation. Right. So we do we are able to look at the workers that we have available with the capabilities to do specific types of work orders and we use that to figure out when we can actually do maintenance, right? Um, oh, here's a good question. So can assets be created automatically in a production order via assembly? So I, I think that's a really good question because I have worked with customers who basically build the asset and then install it and maintain it. And I, I don't think we have one specific way to streamline that creation. Um, normally you'd you would use a production order to track production processes, um, but there's no way to take something you produced in a production order and convert that into an asset. So right now that would be a manual process. Um, just want to check with you, Johan, to confirm. Yeah. 
yeah, you can kind of compare it with the uh, when you purchase an asset, right? Then you have something called the pending assets, where you can create your maintenance asset based on what you um, purchased. But we don't have the same on on the production side. It's also a good um, input. Here's another good question. What is registering downtime used for? It doesn't seem to reserve capacity. So um, that's a really good question. And for anybody who um, didn't catch it, we mentioned earlier on, you can use the production floor execution interface to register downtime, or you can do that through the asset management module user interface. And basically what that does is it lets you say how long a machine was down for and what the reason was. And we want to track that information because it helps us calculate our asset KPIs. So understanding what, you know, was it down for planned maintenance? Was it down for an unexpected outage? Um, and, and any other reasons we might want to track and then use that to drive reporting on our overall asset uptime. So when we're looking at um, asset availability, which then allows us to think about calculating uh, overall equipment effectiveness in production. Anything you want to add to that one, Johan? No. Okay. Um, someone has helpfully pointed out that Murray Fife did a post on LinkedIn about the integration between asset management and field service. So. We'll share that um, in the chat. And Murray is actually who will be our guest presenter to talk about asset management and field service integration in our tech talk. So definitely make sure you catch that and we'll let you know when it's been scheduled so you can register. Um, we have another question about predictive maintenance, which is does that need IOT so we can read from counters and predict maintenance requests or work orders? So this is another really good question and something Johan and I were just talking about. So um, predictive maintenance does usually involve using a counter, whether it's um, you know production quantity or production hours, for example but it doesn't necessarily have to be IOT. You can manually update counter values in the system, or if it's production quantity or production hours, you can have the system automatically update it. And it, it looks at the trend for the value on the counter. So it looks, at, for example, the, the trend for production quantity over time. And when you run your maintenance schedule, for your maintenance plan, it looks at when your counter will hit your whatever your trigger value is, and it'll say, hey, you've set up a maintenance for every 1000 pieces produced. And based on the trend, we expect that you'll hit that next week. So here's a planned maintenance order uh, to do your preventative maintenance or predictive maintenance next week. So that's how we use counter values to create predictive maintenance in Dynamics. Hopefully that makes sense. Johan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that one. No, that, that's correct. OK, um, we do. Oh, uh, go ahead. Here is, is there any link uh, of functional location to record customer address? Not not that no. I'm aware of, but. but um, you can link a, a customer account to an asset. So we are supporting a scenario where you can bill uh, customers for maintenance work. Um, and if you're require. using the if you're using the field service integration, then you might track the if, yeah, service well, account, right? The all that information in yeah. field service. Yeah. Okay. Um, we do we do still have some questions in the chat, uh, but we are out of time. So Johan and I will go through the remaining questions and make sure that we either answer them in future tech talks or that we publish answers um, on the community site or in a doc docs article so that we get to anything that we missed. Thank you so much for all the questions today. Um, please make sure you fill out the survey on 
um, the session that David posted in the chat. And with that, I'll hand it back to David to wrap us up. Fantastic, great session, Anne and Johan. I appreciate it. Uh, I've posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel, and we'd like your feedback on today's session and hear about what you'd like to see in future events. Thank you for your participation. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within the coming weeks. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and our audience for joining us today.